Hi, my name is Jenny Rhodes. I'm the violinist for Salon Yers, and I'm talking to you today to tell you about our piece of Ghosts and Angels, which is my composition that Salon Yers is premiering this September. So I've been given a tidy little list of questions to answer to tell you a little bit more about myself and this piece and how it came to be. The first question is, when did you begin composing? Full disclosure. This is the first time um, I'm presenting myself as a composer with a completely original work um, sent out into the world, to the public, with my name attached to it. Um, on one hand, that's pretty scary. I'm feeling a little self-conscious, a little vulnerable, but at the same time, I'm totally owning it. I'm really excited about it. We've worked with other composers and they always seem pretty excited when they finally get to see their composition played by real human beings, people with you know, ability and talent and who are invested in it and now I've got a taste of that myself as we've started workshopping it. It's really exciting to see something go from an idea to something on paper and then out through real instruments and, and real performers' souls. Um, most of the composing I've done in the past has been arrangements. Uh, I've done a lot of our salon years arrangements, um, the violin parts especially. A lot of times we just slap the violin part on top of a song that fits Jamie really well and you know, we add another layer to it with the violin. And I've done a number of arrangements uh, for students uh, when I'm in a teaching setting and we've needed something specific. So this is the first biggie, so to speak, for me. Um, where do you normally compose? Um, at the piano. I actually didn't start violin until maybe about fifth grade that I finally got into regular private lessons. But I started on the piano because my mom is a very fine pianist and was my teacher. And so uh, musical ideas come to me first through piano still. And you can see the harmony so much better on the piano. Um, and I usually take hand, hand notes, write it out by hand, and then transfer it to the computer. Um, then a lot of editing at the computer. The Ghosts and Angels has taught me a lot about the day-to-day -day grind that composers go through just to make things legible and clear and well engraved on a program and then on paper that's given to musicians. So um, piano first, then to the computer. What is your biggest challenge when composing? Those of you who know me know I have four kids, ages four to 10. And uh, yeah, it's hard to carve out time to do something creative like this. I think a lot of people do creative things will agree that it's difficult to do something for just a few minutes at a time. It's much more effective and fulfilling to immerse yourself in it for several hours. And I have to plan really carefully and deliberately if I'm going to find a couple hours at a time to do something like composing. Tell us a bit about your piece, finally. So Of Ghosts and Angels started to come to be about a year and a half ago. We were working with Robert Springer, an Arizona composer, on a piece we commissioned called A Winter Ride. A lot of you have heard us perform this. Um, a track of it is coming out soon, so make sure you listen to it because it's fantastic. But one of my jobs when we first started working with Robert was to collect poems that could be used as a text. And we knew we wanted something by American women that was in the public domain. So we found a text for him, but I just kept reading. I, this whole door had been opened to this, um, this whole group of women who were writing amazing poetry that I hadn't read before and really was resonating with me and um, I think would resonate with a lot of people, just the themes and the way they expressed them. All three of the poems that I chose, um, they made me cry the first time I read them. And um, I think that they, they will resonate with a lot of our audience as well. So Of Ghosts and Angels is divided into three movements. The first movement is by, the text is by Emily Dickinson. It's called The Bustle in the House. And it's about grief. It's about the fog of grief a person goes through right after they've lost someone and they still have to go through everyday tasks and jobs. Life is going on even after they've lost somebody. Um, and then she draws a metaphor between those daily tasks and the process of grieving. The second poem is called The Answer. It's by Sarah Teasdale and um, it has two parts. The first part, she basically says, when I die and people feel bad for me, this is what I would tell them. And the second half is her answer. That's why the poem is called The Answer. She tells them exactly what she wants them to know now that she's passed. The third poem is by Eliza Snow and it's called Angel Whisperings to the Dying Child. Um, she had written a number of short dedicatory poems to children who had died 
in her community out in the western frontier in the 1800s from a disease that had swept through the area. And then there was this one poem that wasn't addressed to a family or to a child. It had no name in it. Um, and it just expressed what sounds like, by Eliza Snow's standards, like she was just an emotional outpouring of her own, um, her response to the situation, both the sadness and the grief behind it, but also a lot of hope and joy that could be found um, in these really hard times. And if you've read any of Eliza Snow's poetry, it's typically very public. It's meant to be instructional and very useful. And so compared to everything else she'd written, this page of poetry just jumped up as being incredibly emotional by her normal standards, and that really got my attention right away. How do you translate the text musically into your piece? So for the first movement, The Vessel in the House, which is about grief, each musician has a different role. The pianist plays a ticka 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 um, this rhythmically driving thing that's like time, always moving forward relentlessly, time moving on even when you've suffered a great loss. The singer um, is telling, describing the grief, but is very much in a fog. And uh, I think it's interesting that the singer never refers to themselves in first person. Um, so there's that distance that they're trying to create between what's happening and what they're experiencing. And the violinist, that's me, um, is like a specter. Um, you can decide if it's a ghost or an angel of the person they've lost who is, has, I have my own melody, a different theme than the singer, and that melody follows the singer behind as she goes about these daily tasks that she's describing. So when you come listen to it, that's what you can listen for to see how each of those three um, roles is played by a different musician. The second movement is by Sarah Teasdale, and um, the same time I first read her poem, I was also uh, doing a lot of research and learning about um, some music that was used in uh, Latin funeral uh, traditions. I guess that's what all of us read about on our phones when we're at our kids' soccer practices, right? All of us, yeah. But um, I read about some traditions where a song would accompany the funeral procession to usually the church or to the cemetery, and then the song would change upon arrival there, and the cantor or, or the singer would then sing a farewell in first person as if they were the voice of the deceased and that would give them then closure that allowed them to leave and go into the next world. And this two-part uh, tradition in their songs fits so perfectly with the Sarah D. Stale uh, structure of her poem and I had to try it. So as you listen you will hear the first stanza is a procession, um, almost religious in its, in its character, but the second half is much freer and um, I think reflects much more um, what would have been this woman's character and her feelings about what was happening as she communicates with her loved ones before she moves on. So you'll, you'll hear that, it's very distinct. So the third movement um, by Liza Snow, The Angel Whisperings, is the most motivic of the three movements. There are two main motives. The first is uh, this descending interval, usually a sixth on the words darling. Darling, my darling. Eliza Snow, um, when, when the angel is addressing the child, they use that endearment over and over again. Darling, darling, um, as they try to coax the child. And you'll hear that not just in the voice, but in, the, in the, um, the piano and the violin, too. The other motive is this ascending third. Sometimes it's the major third, sometimes it's the minor third. Um, it's actually the basis for the violin theme, you know, the specter theme in the first movement, also. And um, the two places where that motive really has significance are when the angel is trying to describe to the child what will happen when you pass through and you're with the angels. And she sings, Thou shalt bloom. And it's nice and high for Jamie. She gets to go way up there. And it's also the same three notes that are used at the moment when the child passes through the veil to be with the angels. So I love that that very simple three note ascension is used um, consistently throughout the piece and then at those very significant moments in the third movement, right at the very end. What do you like to do in your free time? What's free time? I'm a mom, I don't have free time. <laughs> I mean, I compose, I compose in my free time. Actually, that's not quite true. I used to compose in my free time. This year I actually have a lot of composing and arrangement projects on the table. 
And so I'm, I'm deliberately carving out time for those this year. Beyond that, I sleep. If I get a nap, I'm really excited. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of things I like to do. Um, I used to dance Argentine tango. That's kind of my past life. I used to quilt. That's also my past life. Um, I love to hike. And actually, that's my future life again, past and now my future life, because my kids are old enough that we're starting to hike and camp a lot together again. So that's something I like to do. We have free time as a family. We're pretty diehard Nova fans as a family. We love watching Nova. The black hole episodes, totally my favorites. Um, I do bake probably more for salon years than um, for my family. Now that my daughters are baking, I let them bake for the family. <laughs> um, yeah, those are some of the things I do now. They've changed a lot over the years. So I hope this has um, gotten you excited about these pieces and I hope that a lot of you get to come to the concerts and hear them and I can't wait to hear how you guys respond to them. That's one of the things we love about salon concerts just as an idea and as a vision. We get such immediate feedback from you guys about what you enjoy and how things affect you and which things you like the most. So please come to the concerts. Please tell us what you think. Um, we can't wait to share these with you.